Hi, my name is Jonathan Jones, and I am a physical education teacher in Bowie, Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. I am also a member of Phys Edagogy, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Welcome to the Phys Ed Summit 3.0. Thank you so much for joining us for this 24-hour back-to-back global event. We cannot make this day happen without you. Reminder, we're using technology and things happen. If for some reason the video feed stops, please check out the Tozzle for the new video link. It may take us a few minutes to get it started and rolling again. We thank you for your patience. First and foremost, we would like to thank you, the participants, for taking time to attend the summit. We are very humbled by the outpouring of support and promotion of the summit from each and every one of you. By sharing with one person, you're able to impact hundreds of students. Thank you so much for being here to push best practices, effective physical education, and PD. This is an amazing PD community. We are so excited to be a part of it. After the summit, we will be posting the feedback survey to the Phys Ed Summit 3.0 homepage. We hope that you will provide us with some feedback so that we can make 4.0 even better. In order to receive your PD certificate, you will need to fill out the quick survey after the summit. As moderator, it is my pleasure to introduce our two presenters for this session. Noel Vigyu and David Leith. Noel is a health and physical education teacher at Kennedy Middle School in Natick, Massachusetts. Noel has been teaching and coaching adolescents for over 19 years. He teaches a Fitness for Life program for 7th and 8th grade students. For the past six years, Noel and his colleagues have been working to establish Natick Public Schools as a district that puts evidence-based research into practical applications, helping students to be better learners and live healthier lives. Noel has also presented on a variety of topics, most recently at Mayford Adapted PE Summit in Massachusetts. DePage DuPage County in Naperville, Illinois, Healthy Minds, Healthy Body Institute in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, Simmons College Graduate School of Education, Boston, Massachusetts, and Mayford State Fall Conference in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dave Leith graduated from Bridgewater State University in 2008 with a Bachelor of Science in Physical Education and went on to earn his Master's of Education from Finchburg State University in May of 2013. He just finished his second Master's in Educational Leadership in July 2015 from Ed Edicott College. Dave is currently in his eighth year of physical education teaching at Kennedy Middle School in Natick, Massachusetts. Dave has presented numerous times across the country on exercise and brain and movement in the classroom. He also co-directed a study with his mathematician colleague regarding the link between physical activity and academic performance. He is the director of Bay State Flash AAU basketball program. So without further ado, here is Noah Vigu and Dave Life. All right. So, play from the start. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Blueprint for a Fitness Focused District. My name is Noel Vigu. And I am Dave Leith. And we just spent an hour recording this, <laughs> this the first time, but we didn't hit record. So, it was awesome, and I think you're going to love this. This is a great thing. So, hey, all you geeks out there, big fans of Star Wars, um, I'm a major geek, and I wanted to put a fun reference for Blueprint, and there's your Millennium Falcon right there, so uh, I hope you guys enjoy. So a hey, big shout out to the uh, Phys Ed Summit 3.0 staff and all. Thank you so much for having us. We're honored to be a part of this historic world event. One small step for physical education, one giant step for a healthier generation. Uh, thank yous. Uh, we wouldn't be able to talk without... Mentioning these people, uh, our family, um, our Vice Principal Megan Hat, who's been super important for us on our journey here. 
Uh, we have terrific colleagues uh, as part of our wellness team, Megan Dwyer and Laurie Ross, uh, as well as the Physiology staff. And i got to say, uh, having Native Public Schools give us the opportunity to be able to elicit the change that we've been able to do through our school and district, it's been awesome. Uh, and really, people that have were integral in getting that uh, started or on to the, the next level were Alex and Lindsay Thornton and Chris Gilbert, uh, neuroscientists, researchers. Uh, we can't, couldn't have done it without them taking it to the next level for sure. So a little bit about ourselves. Uh, my name, again, Noel Vigu, uh, master's in uh, health and plus 45 credits beyond that. My initial uh, grad, my initial degree was in sports medicine, my bachelor's and associates there in athletic training. And uh, I was involved in physical education and athletic training through the first eight years of my career. And then I got into strength and conditioning, uh, became a certified strength and conditioning coach at Boston University and then I uh, was there for about five years and then back into where I am now at Natick for the uh, past uh, six years. Uh, 20 total years of uh, teaching and coaching experience. And I'm Dave Light. Uh, I have a master's of education and then I have a second master's in educational leadership. I've been teaching um, for seven years at Natick uh, and I run an AU a uh, basketball program with over 30 teams that keeps me busy on the side from teaching. So why we are here, and besides being part of this awesome program, we want to share our story with you and tell you about our school transformation into a fitness-focused community. Tell you from how far we came uh, to where we are now. Uh, it's been an incredible transformation, and we're really proud of it, and we want to share some strategies and ideas with all of you to maybe inspire you and, and uh, get a conversation going uh, about where we're headed for the 21st century with physical education. Um, we've seen great results as we put more physical activity in through the school day. Uh, we have student behaviors improved, our uh, attendance has improved, fitness levels, health levels have gone up. Uh, we've seen improvements in academic performance and test scores. It's uh, just been an incredible six years uh, for us. So we want to share a story and hope to provide some ideas for you. These are our objectives here, what we want you to hopefully walk away with today. Um, I, Noel is going to talk about exercise in the brain, how it supports learning. Both Dave and I will talk about the, some of the details of how we got started and uh, hopefully tell how we were inspired and maybe um, how it can inspire you. We'll talk about how uh, support came from administration initially and then how things became educator driven. Dave will go over strategies to incorporate physical activity throughout the school day. We'll both talk about where we made mistakes and how you can learn from those for sure. Um, school culture is going to be a big thing you'll hear about throughout the presentation and uh, Dave great strategies for classroom ideas and what they can do to work with um, classroom educators. I'll go over some ideas for where you can get support in the community and talk about your promotion and expansion of the program and we'll be rocking and rolling. So let's jump in, let's explore. Um, my favorite cartoon of all time from Bill Watterson, Calvin and Hobbes there. So we are in the United States of America we live in the state of Massachusetts, uh, in the northeast corner of the U.S. And Massachusetts, there it is there with all the cities and towns uh, broken up. And the blue spot here, I'm going to use the little red pen on here. Oh, this is so fun. I've never used this before. So fun. Uh, this is where Boston, Massachusetts is located and uh, home of the uh, New England Patriots, which I must say, um, as we're doing this presentation, you probably hear a Boston accent, Pakika and Harvard Yard, wicked awesome. <laughs> and, you know, I must say, it, it really comes from the air pressure here. Our air pressure in New England, especially around Boston, is, is much different from other parts of the world and country. So, you know, it really plays, uh, wreaks havoc on our sports equipment and all, especially our, our, our footballs, our American football. So, you got to cut us a little slack there, right? <laughs> All right, so um, that's where Boston is. We're located in the red spot right here. That's where Natick is, uh, just about 15 to 20 miles outside of um, Boston. And that's a picture of Natick Town Common. 
and that was, I think, taken about uh, five or six years ago on Halloween Day. The town is about 35,000 people. It's a you know typical suburb in uh, in around New England. Something unique to Natick is that we have the United States Army's uh, Natick Labs. It's a soldier-focused research center to help the individual soldier uh, perform optimally. And so they go super nuts, whatever they can do to protect them, to help them uh, stay hydrated, uh, how they can feed them, how they can make things lighter, um, protect them from a variety of uh, variety of factors. And then we've gone on a few science field trips there, and it's, it's amazing. Um, it's pretty cool stuff, at least what we were able to see as uh, outsiders. Our town is about 87% white Caucasian. Um, there's been a small influx of multicultural um, students over the last few years. 30% um, of the homes are very supportive of uh, education, having children under 18 there. It's a pretty high percentage for the town. Uh, it's a good mix and blend of white collar, blue collar um, demographics. One thing that, about Natick that's quite unique is that we live in the shadow or surrounded by some of the basically wealthiest towns in Massachusetts. And we're kind of the uh, ugly stepchild or, um, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses basically. The grass is always greener. So we have a tendency to, in education, is compare ourselves to those towns uh, for good or bad or good or, you know, for, for good or bad. Either way, you're going to look at that. For, you know, something that could drive us to be positive and challenge ourselves, but at the same time, it can be bad when we're comparing apples to oranges sometimes there, you know? So where we are from, Natick Public School, a little bit about the schooling system. Uh, there are five elementary schools. We have two middle schools. Uh, Noel and I teach at Kennedy Middle School. There's about 700 students. The outer middle school has about thousand students and then at the high school uh, there's around 1500 students so all in all in Natick there's about just under 5,000 total students from K to 12. Uh, the town is very supportive of education parents are heavily involved we have a great PTO um, parent teacher organization and it's they, everybody's very supportive and they, they want their school system to be the best. Uh, the superintendent has a huge push on technology he wants to be the most technologically sound district in the country so we have plenty of ipads all wireless smart boards uh you name it and then from eighth grade all the way up uh through when they graduate in 12th grade every student has their own laptop uh as a one-to-one -one initiative for the district so that's a little bit about the demographics of Natick, um, a little bit of, you know, tell you a little bit of educationally where we're from and also, the, you know, the, uh, the geography of the area. Um, how do we get started on our journey through physical education and, and changing uh, and basically what was our blueprint? Well, this is it here. We were inspired by Spark. It all started by reading Spark by Dr. John Rady from Harvard University. He's a professor and clinical psychiatrist there. He specializes in ADD, ADHD, and he compiled research regarding the positive effects that exercise had on the brain and learning. Uh, the book covered a lot of other things there, but really the first three chapters, the major portion that we would be concerned with, are focused on exercise in the brain and the physical education department at Naperville Central High School in Illinois. That phys ed uh, department was led by Paul Zintarski. He's now retired but working on a consulting basis. And also uh, the late great Phil Lawler um, and their unique amazing program that they had uh, developed there. Um, do you remember the name of their programs at PE for Life? I think right? It's like PE and then the, the number four um, life. Uh, I think that's part of what they developed uh, as a curriculum. So when you start to read that book and when you go through it, you know, it's some of the things you're like that you start to read and then stand out to you that, yeah, we're meant to move. Like, of course, you know, as physical educators, it's just putting two and two together. This makes so much sense. This is why we do what we do. Uh, but having some of the brain science kind of catch up to the health aspect, 
you know, it's starting to uh, solidify the importance of movement and physical activity using the academic component or the learning component. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes it seems to get lost with uh, the population about, you know, having overall health. So when you look at it here, we're going to cover a little bit of the brain science here. We'll briefly go through that. So we're not much different from what we were 15,000 years ago. And when you look at Paleolithic humans, you know, we're moving all the time. We're going, you know, hunting 5, 10 miles a, a day. Move, 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 move. Those genes and that DNA, is, it's still, that's who we are. We are meant to move. Um, you know, so the sedentary lifestyles that we have now from sit in a car and go through your commute or on a bus, sit at a computer or sit in a classroom, then back on your bus, back on your commute, then back at home, you sit at the computer or on the couch or a table. We don't move. We don't move. And this is obviously leading to a variety of health issues. When we keep kids in the seat all the time, you know, that's going to end up causing issues as well. And we're seeing that as more and more behavior issues, uh, the, the changes in uh, diagnosis with learning disabilities of what we're seeing. You know, as, as our ancestors continue to move, that DNA, that is us. We, we need to move. And when we move, it helps us to learn. We learn better when we move. And it has to do with some of the brain chemistry there with serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, which we'll, we'll go into. This is a big takeaway slide here. One, one thing that you may walk away from um, would be using this slide. The exercise, it affects everything. Everything. If you look at that slide, it affects it all. Um, our motivation, our emotional control, executive functioning, cognition, and learning. Uh, and then all the outcomes of disease. If you think of your grandparents or you know, uh, as, as some of the adults, anyone that's suffering with one of these diseases over there or issues with function, you know, exercise can be a benefit to that. It plays a significant role in, in helping both short-term and long-term issues in our overall health. We need to do a better job of selling exercise and getting our students to be lifelong learners and getting more of our staff and administration to buy in. So as you read Spark, as you go into it, one of the key things that we'll it'll talk about and that you need to know is that the first thing, exercise, you know, particularly affects our executive function. So it's a major buzzword, right? In education, you hear that these days, executive function. What is it? Well, it's all these things that you see right before you on the screen, right? It's all the things that kids and teens are bad at. You know, they, make, they don't learn from mistakes. They, they can't maintain focus. Planning, organizing, they just, it's not them, you know? So the prefrontal cortex plays a major role in all those uh, elements there. And when exercise certainly can help the prefrontal cortex, it's been proven over and over again to help it work optimally and prepare students to learn. This slide is pretty famous. You might have seen it before from uh, Professor Chuck Hillman out of the University of Illinois. And the, he took 20 students, had them just sit quietly, and took their electrical activity brain scans. And then that's a composite on the left. And then he took 20 different students and took those students for a walk. And they walked for 20 minutes. And then took a brain scan composite and put that together there on the right. And you can see the difference. The red, orange, yellow, much more electrically active. And basically the brain's awake and ready to learn compared to just sitting down. Prefrontal cortex engaged, electrical activity engaged through exercise. So we have those two things there, electrical activity, prefrontal cortex, and now we're looking at blood flow, what happens and how the brain changes with blood flow. Increased blood flow spurs growth in the brain, specifically in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is associated with memory. And you know, more and more studies have proven and show this, that, that uh, the more blood flow to the brain with exercise, there's an increased size of that hippocampus and thus improved memory and which can be measured through a variety of uh, test scores and or uh, brain, um, brain tests. So exercise is also helps in regulating aspects of uh, neurochemistry and our hormones released. Um, this is a key element here. The next few slides are from Dr. Rady and which talks about how the regulation of neurochemistry can improve a, student, a student's overall uh, learning or prepare them to learn. 
So if you look at the three key elements there of um, neurotransmitters, then dopamine, neuroepinephrine, and serotonin, uh, as those are regulated, they can help with attention and motivation for students. Uh, we've seen that repeatedly from our staff. Anecdotally, they've told us that over and over again. And as well as parents, they've reported back to us about uh, the change in their students' behavior. Uh, it also helps with impulsivity. Uh, the student that you know, frustrated with learning and really uh, has a difficult time reading and uh, some sort of learning disability there, they can act out and get really super frustrated as they're trying to learn. And uh, an exercise can help regulate the hormones that deal with this uh, Im impulsiveness or learned helplessness as well. Their moods improve, their level of energy is improved, their anxiety can be lowered, self-esteem can be improved. Uh, all these things are regulated with exercise. And nothing to this point can compare to exercise. Uh, exercise readies our nerve cells to bind more easily and to be much stronger. Uh, exercise basically is like miracle growth for the brain. Dr. Rady has said this quite often there. miracle Grow is a product in the United States that helps plants grow. And uh, it's been proven over and over again, you know, helping the plants grow there. And that's what he says, that exercise is like miracle growth for the brain. It, it, exercise does that better than any other pharmaceutical or factors that, you know, we're aware of at this time. And that's, you know, eight years running uh, right now. Exercise increases neuroplasticity. That's, you know, the growth in the cells of the brain there. Uh, as Paul Zintarski out of Naperville, he puts it, Exercise builds brain cells. So, so that's our job as physical educators. Get them moving, get their heart rate up, help to build brain cells. And then it's the job of the classroom educator to fill those cells with the you know, pertinent information that they want them to, to go on and learn. Here's a little research there about the neuroplasticity. You might have heard commercials about from Lumosity about, oh, neuroscience and neuroplasticity, and you can grow your brain and do Sudoku and do these certain um, crossword puzzles and all. Well, before you do those aspects to help your brain grow and learn, exercise. Exercise ahead of time. We need to share that with uh, uh, you know, everybody. And the kids, if we tell the kids now, exercise beforehand, they're going to buy in. Exercise before you read, before you learn, before you study. Uh, there's a couple research pictures there showing you uh, new cell growth in the brain from after exercise and movement. So you have all these things here. We have the research. We have the data. This demonstrates what happens in the brain when we exercise. Um, and exercise would be defined there as you know, moderate to vigorous exercise intensity for 20 or more minutes. So you have the prefrontal cortex executive functioning improved, improved electrical activity, increased blood flow to the hippocampus and the size of the hippocampus for learning and memory. You have the regulation of those neurotransmitters and as well as the release of BDNF to improve uh, the growth of brain cells. So exercise prepares the brain to learn. You either accept these facts and choose to help students incorporate movement or you choose to ignore the science. And, and we wholeheartedly believe in this. And you, know, and you look at the data and how it helps their health as well as their academic performance. You see here in the California state testing, but there's so many reports throughout our country and districts and schools and throughout the world as well, in, in Finland and Sweden. Um, you know, here's a research study there in, in Sweden from 1950 to 1976 and just based in cardiovascular endurance. And what they ended up seeing was uh, kids that were a higher level of fitness went on to better education, more satisfaction with life, higher socioeconomic standing. Uh, and, and that was just cardiovascular based though, uh, as, a, as a side note. Here in America, uh, we have the Center for Disease Control. That's our government health organization. And they did a report in uh, meta-analysis in 2010 of all the research out there based on physical activity and academic performance and all, basically telling people, telling educators, this is good. This is a good thing. Get kids moving during the school day, during school. Get them moving during school. It's going to help their academic performance. There's no negative side effect to that whatsoever. 
So there you have it. Spark, Dr. Rady, read it, get out there. Um, we ha I have a couple links set up on the Tazel, I think, for that. And that's what got us started. That inspired us, and I, hopefully it can inspire you. Um, from here, how it inspired our school to make a revolutionary, unique change to our program. It was kind of based on Naperville having their LRPE, or Learning Readiness uh, Physical Education Program, Zero Hour PE. They put students who were struggling with certain academics into physical activity before they went to math or English class or language or literacy. And they saw amazing results when they did this. So our superintendent wanted to replicate that in our school, and that's where we came up with Fitness for Life class. And this started in 2009. This was um, basically our keystone. It's, it was our foundation of our SPARK initiative. Um, it was funded on a three-year grant from a local health foundation. And what ended up happening was we started off with our eighth grade students in our middle school at uh, Kennedy Middle School, uh, having their fitness class every day for 90 days in small, like 18 to 30 student class size. And we did about 30 minutes of exercise during that time wearing heart rate monitors and uh, having them survey what they were feeling based on mood, sleep time, energy level, and concentration focus and all. Um, they still had their regularly scheduled PE classes twice a week or basically twice in a six-day cycle. So they could have fitness and PE back-to-back -back and, and or, you know, just that same day as well. So we really increased our physical activity uh, PE time to about 225 minutes per uh, week. Um, seventh graders then, after the first 90 days, we had them for the last 90 days, and uh, it was something that was, you know, revolutionary. It was a very unique program, and we wanted to track to see what happened over the the, uh, the course of three years. So how do we fit this into our schedule? Like, how do we do that, and including PE and all? Uh, Dave will talk briefly about how our schedule fitted in, and then we'll go from there. So at, at our school, we have a seven... Uh, period day or seven block day um, and so at these seven eighth graders they have their four we call them core classes which is your math social studies science and for us it's language and literacy um, then they have a foreign language block uh, they have that every day and then they have their special or unified arts which is their PE class music art band chorus health class tech ed those type of classes they see uh, twice out of six days, um, and you should see you know, three in a trimester. So it's you know, two, two, and two. Uh, and then for our, the last period uh, in that seven block is, a, is something called flex time, which used to be used as enrichment. Uh, some teachers use it as, you know, they'd have a double math block or double social studies. Uh, some use it as RTI time, uh, time to, to organize themselves or time to work with the, the students that are struggling. Uh, it was kind of a an open period of time that the teachers could use uh, however they like. So for us, it fit in very nicely to take that time and turn it into a fitness class. So that would finish their seven period day. So at this point, uh, we were going 90, 90, 90 days, 90 days. But what we found was after that first year, 60 days worked a lot better in a trimester uh, element for a variety of reasons. So this is what we've done over the last five years, and this has become our schedule, as you can see on the screen there. So you might think, like, wow, well, how did, was administrative supportive of this? Were, you know, how were the staff, did, were they, did they buy in? Were they on board with this? Well, if you think about it, we're taking away time on learning, right? And so that's something that certainly could be stressful for any educator. So we'll address these topics a little bit later on uh, in the presentation. Uh, right now, I just want to let you know what our goals for the program um, are and, and how they've developed over the time. Uh, you can read them right there. Basically, I'm going to talk about uh, two of the main points uh, at that. is the use of heart rate monitors. I can't say enough good things about the Polar Bluetooth uh, H7 program. Um, that program has students wearing a, a $90 heart rate monitor. Um, with a real comfortable soft strap that fits around their torso and then sends the signal out to either a watch which we got rid of using the watches it just sends it out to a iPad and the iPad then picks up their uh, information records it second by second 
and then you have all that data to be able to track uh, the student's productivity and effort and also you can share that online with the students and or their family um, at home even that day. Uh, it's a, a remarkable program and it's something that has helped develop our culture uh, for students with effort and productivity. Uh, and it's technology is awesome and it's a great tool to help you know, work technology into physical education. Not the easiest thing to go out and buy in a budget, but we've been able to write a few grants to be able to get the, um, the, the products and the, the equipment for fitness. About 30, we had 30 of the heart rate monitors at first, and then uh, we recently bought 70 more. Uh, we were able to get those with uh, our great support from our superintendent last year. So one other key thing that I would mention too that makes fitness very unique from physical education is that we go uh, into a lot uh, of aspects in regards to nutrition, body image, and body composition. Uh, if we were going to test them for all the five elements of fitness, well, we're going to address those, especially through um, these teenage years and developing body image and all. And especially with our American culture with the focus on you know thinness and there can be obsessiveness about their appearance. You know, we want to address these early on and develop healthy body images and uh, look at fitness from a health perspective rather than uh, an appearance perspective or a performance perspective. Uh, and so that's something that fitness definitely focuses on and something also that, you know, physical education definitely touches on, but only seeing them twice a week or twice in a six-day cycle, it, it can be a challenge to fit in the uh, amount of time that I can spend in fitness class. So we have great results. As you can see here, uh, this has continued through this past year of 2014-15. Um, in the 2000, uh, through 2009 through 2012, when these were reported, some of this was the testing data that I went through and pre and post. And you can certainly email me or ask me any questions about how we came, uh, how, what our testing protocol was. And then the other things were reported through student, teacher, and parent surveys and our administration as well. Um, this has been an amazing health and fitness impact on our school, but it's also had a pretty remarkable academic impact that we've seen uh, from our teachers, students, and, and uh, parents as well reporting uh, what a wonderful thing that it's been for uh, their kids to have fitness as a part of their um, academic program. It's, it's something that goes through every single day. So at this point here, we get it. Uh, it's tough to have been sit, sitting down for you know, almost 30 minutes and uh, hearing all this information. Also, get up, move a little bit, um, you know, take a little brain break, uh, stretch out for a second. If you want to ask us any questions on Tosl or take a second that we can go over and do that. Um, we'll, we'll check those now and, and see uh, how we can answer any things for you, any questions that you might have. So we'll get back started in, in a, about 10 seconds or so. Uh, Mr. Life, Dave is going to be talking about what happened through the first few years of physical education when fitness was introduced and what some of the challenges were there and the culture that uh, was basically what we were dealing with at that point and, and how we we're able to change it. So um, that's what Dave will be dealing with and uh, sharing with you now. All right, so and we tell you this, um, just so, and maybe some of you out there can relate to this is where I am now, or this is where I, I just was. Uh, so maybe this hit home with some of you and you can help uh, see our journey and maybe that'll resonate with uh, some of you. So my first year was in 2008. I was a brand new first year teacher out of teacher college. Uh, and my co-teacher was also a brand new first year teacher. So the two of us trying to get the blind lead them blind because um, we had no curriculum. Uh, the curriculum we were given basically had very few elements uh, and the kids told us that they played kickball, dodgeball. Uh, when it was nice outside, they go outside and play capture the, the frisbee or chicken, uh, which I capture the flag. Uh, they ran the pacer once a month and they did the dance unit because they had to because the other middle school does it for common assessments. Um, and the old PE teacher was, uh, the, then went to health, uh, and that's basically what they said they did. Um, one day was kickball, next day was, was dodgeball. Um, 
So it was very hard to change the culture of the kids who just want to kick the ball around the gym and throw balls at each other. Uh, it's a very big sports element, a lot of skills-based things that uh, we had to build up to those those games. Um, compared to, to Noel with his fitness class, who had nice hard monitors, brand new equipment, you know, only 20 kids compared to our 65 kids. Um, and coming in, the, the administration set it up that I would have nothing to do with Noel. I don't need to talk to him or have anything to do with him. So they already created this this war between us um, that was, you know, it was unfair. There's a weird culture to uh, walk into at that point. You know, it's like, how do you transition from old school PE to the new PE that we all know right now for, you know, the 21st century? You know, uh, we have all these ideas and things that we were learning in teachers college. And I came from uh, strength and conditioning and, and all these uh, things that were, we were using and these high level uh, movement skills and, and analysis and assessment. And now we're totally separated and we have this culture that was, we're walking into that, you know, we just wasn't prepared for. So that's my mistake, number one, is that I was clueless to traditions, their perceptions uh, and rituals that were going on there, students and staff. So I, I would warn, you know, people now that if you go into a new school or if you're going into your first job is get a sense for the traditions there. What are the perceptions? What's the curriculum like? You know, what do people do for activity outside of school with family and friends that's a, a key thing there second thing dave mentioned already that we were living on an island like we weren't collaborating or anything at that point we i was you know basically head down and focused on hyper focused on what i was doing with fitness and we weren't working together as collaboratively as best we could I mean, we definitely chatted and and uh you know talked about some classroom management things, but we weren't working together for a vision. We weren't given a vision or a focus for what we want to see three years from now, five years from now. So that was a challenge. And we didn't get out to share our ideas or research with anyone else. I mean, nobody. Didn't talk to classroom educators, nobody else across town, uh, none of our colleagues. That was definitely a mistake that you could learn from, um, you know, to get going early on. You got to sell exercise in the brain too. That is a key thing. Like promote that as much as you can. As much as the 21st century is, you know, where it's here, and we need to share and sell what the importance of exercise, knowing the the new science to uh, exercise and the brain. You got to get people to buy in, and that's and that's a part of the way you can do that. The other element there too, I would say, is connect with a academic teacher get someone on board that can try some of the movement in the classroom and once they start to see positive results they're going to start to spread it out to um, you know other educators there it's tough for the PE teacher or the quote unquote gym teacher uh, to go around and say hey you guys got exercise you're going to move more we, we unfortunately sometimes it's not respected and if they hear it from one of their colleagues that tried it they might be more likely um, luckily, we have a really good culture in our school that, you know, a lot of our classroom educators, once we started sharing ideas with them, you know, they were totally on board and, and uh, you know, we have great collaboration at that point. But, so here we are at year two. So we decided to focus on the lower grades, our fifth and sixth graders, and the seventh and eighth graders, we kind of continued to what they, they knew and asked for. Um, we kind of rode, rode those grades out, and then we kind of started new as the fifth and sixth graders got older, and the incoming fifth and sixth graders, um, would know, this is all they know is a new PE. Uh, so we, we changed some of the activities. As, as there was less elimination games, less standing in lines. Um, basically, we just wanted kids to move, move more. And so at that point, you know, it was just the start there, and we are just starting to crack in the surface of what we wanted to do, but we really didn't know what we wanted to do. So we just decided, like, Let's make it easy. Start with the fifth and sixth graders, and the seventh and eighth grade. You know, not that they're a lost cause, but it's be much more challenging to change that culture. Especially then, they're going to be going on to the high school, so the focus was uh, young. Then, if we looked at support, like where are we going to get support, and where can that come from? Um, our director was planning to retire at the end of the year. Super upbeat, great supportive guy. Like you know, our biggest cheerleader. He always would say the. The old school is the new school now, you know, from what he remembers from 35, 40 years uh, of physical education uh, career. But the problem which we referred to there is uh, that we had 
no cohesive, collaborative, comprehensive vision to go with this new program. Um, you know, we're inspired by Spark. Rady comes to speak. We get the fitness program in this school, but you know, where are we going with it? What's going to be the outcome down the road? What would we like to do? So uh, at that point, we were just kind of left to our own devices, like to make things educator driven. And we took the torch and ran with it and said, all right, let's, let's go for it. And so we had a few pockets of positive things happening. Uh, again, though, it was in isolation. It wasn't all cohesive. So that was kind of a, a thing, a learning point for you guys, is that if you're going to start something, get people on board and make, a, make an action plan, have a vision, uh, put together some goals. You know, at this point, we were just kind of working from uh, shooting from the hip. Um, and as you can see, there were some things that were positive that were happening there, but it was sporadic. So the game changer for us in the next step was actually developing an action plan and getting on board with uh, neuroscientists and other physical educators, like-minded professionals. Um, we were able to attend the Spark Institute in the summer of 2011. Uh, this was an amazing program that was three and a half days uh, of pretty intense team building, uh, as well as neuroscience and also action planning, working with um, John Rady, working with his group, Alex and Lindsay Thornton and, and Chris Gilbert, and working with Dave Spurlock of uh, South Charleston, South Carolina. Here's a reference uh, where you can find on the tozzle of, of his information of uh, Dave Spurlock. And we were able to get a action plan together of about 11 things of what we wanted to accomplish uh, from that uh, that retreat, that institute. It was amazing. It was our game changer. So that took us to the next level. We had an action plan. We knew we had about 11 things that we wanted to get done. We knew we wanted to help promote the program to parents in the community. We wanted to uh, get more kids to buy in and our teachers on board. We wanted it to happen that year. Just, you know, how do we do this? How do we put that together? So we figured, all right, you can find support with leadership. You know, look to the superintendent, our new wellness director, our principals. Everybody had some sort of support along the way, and they were a part of the Spark Initiative. Uh, we were really lucky to have that support um, from everybody. And, you know, when we developed the action plan, though, it just wasn't the same as having them develop it. So it was difficult to get, you know, them all in or completely buy into it. It was more so... Um, in piecemeal, uh, in spots along the way. So year three, I mean, our goal coming back from this institute with our action plan was to get as much physical activity at our school as possible. That's from before school, in PE class, in the classroom, and after school. So, you know, for all day, as much movement as possible uh, for these kids. Uh, we were inspired by Dave Spurlock, and his link is on our tozzle. Uh, if you to check out, he had these class managers, he called them brain breaks. Uh, there were videos so the teachers could play in their classroom if they didn't feel comfortable um, having their own or leading their own brain breaks. So we took that and put our own spin on it and created our YouTube page uh, down below, which is also on our tozzle. Uh, here's a picture of it here. Um, and it has about 25 videos or so. There's a lot of, uh, you can see it, there's uh, Noel and I, um, teacher driven. There's, the cheats videos and we've progressed now that there's actually kids have their own videos and then, uh, that's been a, a huge buzz in our school as the kids want to see themselves on the big screen on YouTube so uh, highly recommend it you can use iMovie to make these it's very easy or there's another uh, iPhone app called Video Star uh, you can check those out uh, so that was our vision there was uh, of the th of the 11 goals that we had there were really three big ones that we had, and, and you know one of the uh, the biggest ones there was we wanted to, to create the the YouTube channel and videos for our classroom educators. Um, we also one of the goals was to present at our faculty meeting and share the information with our staff, and so uh, that was done with a Prezi, and you can find that on the Tuzzle there. You can see the Prezi, and uh, there's an awesome video there called "An Apple a Day Is Not Enough" um, that was shared with us from Dave Spurlock and it's an excellent video something that's a great kickoff to share with your students or uh, community members there um, I already showed you this there that's our home page for native KMS fitness free videos for you to use in your classroom uh, and academic classroom settings for sure like 
probably two to four minute uh, little brain breaks, get their heart rate up. Um, I'm there in the red, that's Noel, and Dave's over on the white shirt uh, right over there. You know, the videos were pretty awesome, and we just thought that they would use them in our classrooms, and we were pretty excited about having the opportunity to uh, give them to our, back to our kids and support our staff. But we didn't realize it actually went out to the world, and we got letters from little kids uh, saying how much they liked it in their second grade class. We even heard from uh, the state director for special education in, in Minnesota and uh, how well received the videos were there. Uh, it was pretty awesome. So coming into year three and four of this uh, Spark initiative, uh, we grow with the concept of fit kids equals fit minds. Uh, so we continue to educate the students on exercise in the brain and the positive benefits that exercise has for them uh, and what will happen in their classroom uh, when they go back to, you know, to their classes. Um, the Prezi that we showed you earlier, that was another way to educate the staff on what exercise in the brain can do, and then we did it as well in our classroom. Um, we want to get, again, less away from the team sports model and really teach about physical literacy and pushing kids um, to figure out how their body works and when they put forth effort, uh, what happens. So we major, major effort, uh, focus on efforts um, in our classes in PE. I used the term with my fitness class that we were tracking their productivity, like what effort, what, how can you measure your productivity, your effort during that time and, and trying to change the culture around tracking their effort with heart rate. And it's been a, a definite uh, process. You know, there's still some students that um, have a difficult time understanding some aspects there, but we've definitely seen in a major turnaround where we have, you know, uh, compliance isn't the right word, but buy-in is really it. Like kids really buy into more, moving more and, and hey, what heart rate, what am I at today? And they can, they can see on the iPad, you know, what's actually happening and how well they're doing. It's that instant gratification, instant feedback uh, that has been a, a real positive in our, in our classes. So we wanted to get more physical activity in PE class. So we changed the way we grade. It's, we have a bigger emphasis on efforts and participation, participation and less of a focus on they get graded if they change or if they show up on time, behavior. if they're safe, yeah. behavior. Those are the things that are classroom management issues that we deal with. We really, their grade is mostly focused on their productivity and effort. So to help them in that, we came up with new warm-up ideas which we call CVEAs, cardiovascular endurance activities. Uh, it's all heart rate based. So that's for about the first 10 to 20 minutes of class, these kids are moving and getting their heart rate up. Uh, again, their goal is to get 20 minutes in their target heart rate zone for every class. The last 20 minutes is when we get into our game and activity for the day. As you see here, here are some of our CVEAs, our cardiovascular endurance activities. Um, shuttle runs with cards. We use a lot of uh, different activities using cards. We use the pacer. These are videos which we should make available on uh, Toswell. If we don't have them there, then just email us. We can certainly share them with you. Pacer is what we use for our cardiovascular endurance assessment. And, uh, you know, not that we want to run that um, all the time or, you know, think of it as a boot camp. We assess once a month to kind of dipstick and check where they're at. And uh, then sometimes as a warm-up, we'll do this uh, just thrown in there. Uh, so, I mean, these CBAs, the, the goal is to get students moving. Uh, we have, again, 65, 70 kids in the gym at a time moving as much as possible, so not standing in lines. So we came up with these different activities um, to get students moving. Uh, there I am in the black. Um, and it, it's been very receptive. Some of these are just to get kids moving, and they're, they're um, exercise-based, you yeah. know, just having to do exercise, jumping jacks, no high knees, etc. Right, it's, it's like fitness-based. It's not yep. something where we're making a game, per se, or using equipment. But you see the smiles on their faces, even just as they're, they're working out there. And those are seventh graders at that time. Uh, and there are some games that we use with cars to keep it, you know, a little more challenging and exciting for the kids. To, but we constantly switched up what we're doing each day. At this point, we're at the third year of the program and, and looking at our students, there was a shift. We were seeing it. The culture shift was on. Uh, they were enjoying the changes that we had implemented. We were getting more buy-in. Kids were responding as far as their productivity and effort. Um, it, was, it was palpable. You could feel it. Uh, we were teaching about exercise in the brain in PE class as well as, you know, teaching about spark elements and exercise in the brain in fitness. We became much more flexible, as Dave was saying, about our grading. 
and where we pick our battles. You know, are we grading on them being prepared and changing their clothes, or are we grading on them actually just getting out there and participating rather than having them sit out? And so we were, we were much more flexible in what the previous culture or the way we were taught how to grade and assess students. Uh, and so that had been a fundamental shift, and I think as moving forward, we're, we're happy with where we're at uh, with our students and how we assess them and how they're graded and our relationship building with them uh, around, you know, these um, classroom management and class you know, grading as well. So we made it more, made them more accountable. We held them more responsible in their grading and they responded. They stepped up to it. We explained differences and similarities. Like we just were honest with them and candid about why fitness is here, why it's different from PE and how PE will have some similarities to it as well. Um, so the culture was definitely changing and things were moving in a positive direction with our students for sure. Uh, we also saw that with parents. Parents were really supportive. They came to our after school activities that we started to set up. Uh, they were really into it. They started to call administration and ask, hey, how come my kid can't take more fitness? You know, it was really something that was quite positive. Administration was very skeptical at first and, you know, is this really going to help out, you know, after three years, where is this going? Uh, but really things had turned around. They saw the benefits on learning right away and the kids' behavior and all the statistics that we ended up, uh, you know, gathering through the first three years. And they got to a point where, you know, you're doing what's best for kids. You guys need to present this information and share with, um, you know, superintendents, administration, other people throughout the country. We shared our, we had, this is what you got to do from day one, get this information out to the community, educate them. They, they have old school impressions about what PE is, what gym class uh, was, what they went through. So we started to share the positive results, you know, it took us three years to figure this out, but let them know the good things that were happening. Um, we started to make seasonal newsletters that I'm sure many of you do that as well, but it really makes a big difference. We shared kids' successes in there told them about uh, you know, tips for nutrition and share, tell them about what we're doing with our assessments. Um, the more you can educate and share information, I think parents are, are really pleased with that. We had an outstanding bike study that was done in 2012 and that was revolutionary in the area of neuroscience and all. Um, and our morning program, the community loved both of those things. We'll talk more about those in a minute. We set up a really cool open house presentation with our parents and families and uh, our, again, our after school tournaments have been awesome. Uh, we've had some really great things to reach out to the community and it's been a, a positive relationship for sure. The other thing is we talked about kids buying in, we talked about parents and administrators buying in. You know, it's our teachers who can't say enough about how supportive and how they stepped up to the plate. And really, they, they do it all, you know. There's so much on their plate and so much that they have to go through their checklist. You know, we were concerned or worried, like, how are they going to respond to adding another thing to it, right? But unbelievable. They were amazing. Uh, getting exercise equipment in the classroom, doing more physical activity, uh, loving the videos, asking to do more videos, always getting requests from the, the kids. Uh, we can't say enough about our incredible uh, students, I'm sorry, incredible classroom teachers and what they do for our students. Um, it, it was really positive and although they had struggles as you can see there you know there's difficulties with comparing schools and you know other challenges that they had to deal with with uh, evaluation through the Massachusetts uh, teacher evaluation system they still continue to step up and support student learning for sure with movement. As we said in the beginning of the presentation about reaching out and finding a teacher uh, that can do movement in the classroom and, and build on these ideas I reached out to a sixth grade math teacher uh, and here's her, her data so she had uh, three different classes that she taught, um, and two of the classes got energizers. They had, and she gave a six question um, quiz um, periodically, and these were questions that were on our state testing, so she had to give them. Um, as you can see, they, at the top, there's lower, uh, middle, and, and high. The high is the high achieving students, uh, the accelerated class, uh, if you will. And you can see that they did not get moving, while the other two who are supposed to be a, a lower level, uh, got the movement breaks, and on those same questions, the two that got the movement breaks scored higher than the higher achievers. 
it's uh, something that, you know, you have this data that you see in California, throughout the world, other districts, but, you know, we wanted to see it for ourselves. Like, is this actually making an impact? And uh, it certainly was. Anecdotally, we saw that uh, with behavior, focus, and mood. When kids moved during the class, teachers saw that they were better behaved, they were more focused, improved mood, compared to when they didn't move. So when we're talking about getting classroom educators on board, here's some ideas here for you. Um, and as you go through this, with change, there's always limitations and barriers. Uh, you just got to keep plowing through and, and do what's right for kids. Um, so some ideas is you could use our videos, make your own videos. Again, Video Star on your iPhone or iMovie. Um, kids can lead the, the class, get them up and have them do different um, jumping jacks, etc. Change obviously takes time. Um, you know, one of the things that I would say there is that there's many teachers that could be uncomfortable with movement. So giving them different strategies is really helpful. Some of them will just take it and go and they'll have no problem. Like, hey, I got this. Oh, this is great. I'm going to use those videos. I'm going to exercise with them. But if you mention it to some teachers, you can see them, their body language, even right away. They're like, I'm not moving in front of my kids. That's going to be really difficult. So you got to know that some people, it might be out of their comfort zone to do that. So there's plenty of resources that you can see in our Tazzle that you could certainly use there. Um, what might work for you might not work for somebody else. You know, you don't want to do the Energizer videos every day and <laughs> the same song over and over again. You know, you got to have some sort of variety there. But if you're enthusiastic and you sell it, especially as a classroom educator, uh, oh man, your kids are going to be thrilled. And what, what's helped us is some teachers were hesitant, so we went in our, the classroom um, ourselves and led the class managers to teach the teachers how to do it and how to get, how to get the kids back um, to class, a transition uh, smooth so they're not all jacked up and, and you know, riled up here. Yeah, any behavior issues. Yeah. So we did some different transitional um, exercises to get them back down, and it Teachers really bought in once I saw it firsthand. Uh, some other ideas, you use exercise flashcards, exercise dice. Uh, these two links at the bottom are um, on our Tazel, highly recommend. One of my personal favorites is a review is when you do a true false around the room question, and true could be the answer is jumping jacks. The students do jumping jacks and false is high knees. So that way the teacher can quickly see who knows the, the answer to the question by just by simply doing movement. So they have a variety of uh, videos that are on both of those there. They're very elementary based, I'd say probably pre-K through maybe fourth grade or so on the move to learn out of uh, Mississippi there. Uh, and then the New York City one, same thing. There's some strategies there to probably more like, you know, pre-K through sixth grade or so. Um, we've used them occasionally and like Go Noodle, if I'm sure many of you are familiar with also. Another success we've had is exercise equipment in the classroom. Um, so we use fitness balls as chairs, as you can see here. Uh, we use standing desks. Um, and an alternative for that is we have some of these that you see right there. Um, but if you have extra music stands, you can put those in the back of the classroom. Uh, that's a great cheaper alternative uh, if you have extra ones sitting around. We have stationary bikes in our special education classroom. Um, and this has created a huge buzz as students are rushing to class because they want to use exercise bikes um, so badly. We wrote a grant to be able to get these uh, originally. Uh, we were able to raise funds a few different ways and student activities I think was one way. Um, our PTO had been supportive of that, uh, our also education foundation. that We've been lucky to be able to uh, just have local funding that had been able to support movement in the classroom. And I think we have around six or eight bikes that we use uh, in different special education classrooms uh, at this time. Uh, and, and we're thrilled with how much the students have responded to them. You, the key is when you get these, you know, that's really expensive model that's pictured there. But if you get one, you want to get them that uh, don't, they don't make noise or become a distraction uh, in the classroom. Some teachers use balance boards. Um, again, just another way to get students up out of their chair and either, either moving or standing. Uh, some teachers even have this a standing area in the back. You know, a lot of research now is coming out about the, the importance of balance and what that does for the brain. Um, they talk about that in the bike research as well as balancing on the bike and what it does for the brain. Um, one of the key things in corporate America is these uh, treadmill desks that they're using or having you know basically exercise boardroom meetings. 
this is probably impractical for education with being uh, how expensive treadmills are and how cumbersome and uh, also uh, for space wise it's just not going to be feasible but it, it's if it's coming from the corporate world you know it's uh, something that's good for everybody as far as productivity and uh, getting keeping people healthy, right? So we've talked about some ideas in PE class, some ideas you can do in the classroom. Here are some other ideas after school. We have uh, a variety of different after school tournaments, which is again, creating a positive school culture where everybody comes down and cheers for one another. They wear their uniforms, the parents come and cheer them on. It's this great school event that we have. We have intramurals after school. Um, there's other interlastic sports. The fitness center is open. Uh, so just trying to get as much movement after school as possible. So. Also, we're thinking, you know, where else can we have physical activity introduced to our students? And we do that before school as well. We started with just an open gym space that one of our um, teacher support staff uh, educators were able to get the kids in there early in the morning and just being physically active and, and a place to move and get the wiggles out. Uh, and then we actually had a formal bike study done by the neuroscience research group to see what happened when kids biked for 30 days, 20 minutes each day consecutively, and got their heart rate up to 150 beats during that time. Their research results were amazing, and there's a, a link to that on the Tozzle there, so you can check that out. Um, it inspired our own Kennedy Before School exercise program. Um, you can see that here, that we ended up doing that at first as a pilot, and then now we do it every fall and spring for about four to five weeks. Uh, we do a variety of activities there, and biking is the paramount. We have 30 specialized mountain bikes that our superintendent purchased uh, after the research results came out and how uh, positive the results were for students and all. In fact, the first time that we did our program, we had like 30% of our staff came out to exercise with students and all. Uh, it was remarkable. It was awesome to see and to be a part of that special uh, before school exercise program. There's uh, a few other ideas that we have uh, also there. We have, do laps for lunch. That happens uh, when kids, after they eat for about 15 minutes or so, they're eligible to be able to get outside and move and walk and run around. Um, in a middle school setting, that's pretty unique since they don't have recess, so uh, it gives them a little time to socialize and exercise at the same time. And then we're able to have, during school day, a DDR tournament or a Dance Dance Revolution tournament where Kunami came in and had this... Uh, Big tournament for the, a lot of different schools in the Boston area. It was done through the AFRD convention was there in Boston during that time, what now known as SHAPE, uh, National Organization, and we were lucky enough to have this happen. So there was our Sweet 16 uh, that uh, battled it out, uh, the top 16 in the school, and the two gentlemen that are holding boxes uh, on the left and in the back, um, the guy in the back got first place in the state, and the guy in the left was third place in the state. So... We shared a lot with you guys in, in being able to go through all the great things that exercise can do for health as well as for um, overall academic performance. And when we're talking about academic performance, how do they measure it? It usually comes down to, unfortunately, standardized testing. And when people look, you know, how they measure your school, how is your school performing, this is where they go. And so ultimately, through this time that we've changed our school and transformed into more and more fitness, we've seen great results with our standardized testing. Um, it's been awesome. It's been quite an improvement over this time, and we're really proud of the efforts of our students and staff. So this is what we've shared with you, our brain science. We hope that you've been inspired. Uh, we hope that you learned from our mistakes and some of the aspects uh, that we've gone through in our journey. Dave and I shared the physical activity ideas in the school uh, and before school, after school, throughout the whole day. You gotta get out and promote the exercise and the science uh, for sure and get the community involved. Um, stay positive, you know, nothing's perfect for sure. And use us as a resource. Feel free to connect to us. Um, there's our email, there's our Twitter handles. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your time with us this morning and whenever you've checked this out at some point, um, we really appreciate it and you know keep us involved keep us po keep us posted on how your ideas go thank you thank you